Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Lewis Carter. I'll tell you all about him in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will definitely find that Lou is, uh, you do it with a common cause to bring people together. Welcome, Lou Carter. It's a pleasure to have you on the show again. Yeah. I, get, I was on your first show, John, which was awesome. And now I'm here with you today. I can't think of a better place to be. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, that's cool. I want to tell everybody about you. Lewis Carter is the founder and CEO of Best Practice Institute, author of more than 10 leadership books, including his newest, In Great Company. He's a, voted a global guru top 10 in organizational culture. Um, he hosts a leader to leader Newsweek show, way cool, way ahead of me. And his newest book, In Great Company, How to Spark Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Workplace. Uh, that's tough to do. So it's even hard to, for me to say. Um, and uh, he's written lots of stuff. He's consulted with companies all over the world. Um, and. News Venture is a partner with Newsweek to publish the top 100 most loved workplace. And he has a separate company, BPI, a branded entity, to provide benchmarking. And so Lou is that rare uh, creature who blends research, hard research, as well as the emotional quotient because he's just a genuinely kind person and an exceptional leader. So Lou, welcome to the show. So. Thanks, John. Now that we're done talking about you, we should get to me now. <laughs> uh, we have to let folks know that we have known each other for a very long time. Um, actually, I was thinking like 2005, 2006, you, you were doing something. And so uh, and finally, we connected. We're both members of 100 Coaches, which is fun. So anyway, Lou, first question. Uh, I always have to let Lou know that this will be a question. <laughs> It's the only way I can, you know, yeah. this my cue. We're, you're focused on organizations that are rooted in love and respect. What does that, we use those words, Lou, but what does it mean in an organizational context? So. It's, it's funny. I, I was at a, a, a conference uh, and I was speaking at it on love and respect and at uh, ATD. And I had a heckler in the audience. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was the funniest thing. And, and I, I never had one before. And uh, so it was the first thing, first for me, it was a consultant, uh, <laughs> <laughs> number one. So uh, Of course, one. of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many of those it takes to uh, screw in a light bulb. Um, and at this, so what she said to me was, because I was, I was presenting research on love and respect. And basically the research says something simple is when you uh, feel respected, you'll produce up to two or four times more than when you don't, which is not rocket science, uh, clearly. Uh, but she said, you know, she said, stop. How is your, that any different than this research, that research, this research? And she says, and you're going to need to, to, uh, to deserve my respect. I said, she, you're going to need to earn it. So I yeah. said, oh. so I said, I stop. I said, just stop for one moment, <laughs> which was important because I had to kind of collect my thoughts and figure out yeah. oh, what is it? What do I say to her? And uh, so I said, well, let me ask you a question. Thanks for your question. Let me ask you a question. Uh, would you feel respected if I asked you the same question? She said, no. I said, uh, well, do you think uh, any research really, for that matter, is uh, unbiased? So, so she said, well, some research has the inter IRB, the board, and they have <laughs> specific things they go through. They have different peers. I said, well, do you think that might be biased? Sometimes <laughs> there's only four peers on these boards. Yeah. The IRB has certain standards. Well, I guess not. So I said, well, do you think, would you, after I just asked you these questions and you, and I just attacked you and said, you don't matter. Would you now work with me? I guess I wouldn't. All right, thanks for the lesson that you just taught everyone. How <laughs> way to go, and Lou, you and you did it with grace. I will say that you did it with grace. Grace is what it's all about, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and being in front of people and being at that front line, and you know, there's one thing about 
you know, acting and being the part of a leader. Mm -hmm. It's another about helping others to be leaders and being that example, because it doesn't stop it with you. It doesn't stop with you as a leader. It, you have to coach everybody. You have to live the example. You have to be that person on the front lines constantly. You know, McDonald's didn't happen in a day. There's processes and that took place to enable that perfect hamburger. At the, <laughs> you know, Rich Carlton, that perfect customer service. Yeah. It wasn't on one person. It was everyone. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you used that example of Ritz Carlton because I have worked with some folks in there and, and they had uh, had some opportunities in healthcare. And I lauded them on the work that they do. And they say, you don't realize how hard that is. And they weren't patting themselves on the back, but that daily, you know, when you, uh, Ritz Carlton is this cust uh, heightened customer service and attention. And people at every level in the organization, including the chambermaids, have authority to make decisions for the benefit of customers. That takes so much work to do. That's where love and respect comes in, does it not, Lou? So it does. It, you know, in those circumstances at Ritz Carlton, it's part of the automation as well. When they find an opportunity where they can help a customer in a circumstance that is exceptional. They, they give them 5K. <laughs> so <laughs> now what's funny about the 5K is nobody wants to take it because they just want to be excellent at their job. It's, it ha people haven't taken up the 5K offer. Um, they've often said, I'm doing my job. I'm living the, the values. I'm here for a reason. I, I value customer service. I value being in this environment. Uh, Ritz is a great example of that kind of best practice. <laughs> You know, and that's that's love and respect. I mean, it's treating it's hiring the right people uh, and then treating them. And I loved how you deal with it. You know, this 5K offer. Hey, I just like doing my job. And I think so often we have this perception and based in some degree of reality of adversarial between employee and manager and all of that, which of, of, it does exist. Of course, there's that. But too often we jumped uh, we jumped to the negative and that's where the respect comes in, you know. Um, and so that's I'm glad you're shining a light on this. So. And, and that's what people say, that respect is the new ice in the book, in Great Company. The main chapter is respect, and respect is the new currency. People value respect over money in our, in our research. Uh, you might say that's nonsense. Uh, but the truth is that happiness and fulfillment stops around 140000 or 120000 140000 a year right. or so. Um, so really, we're looking for fulfillment through our connections with others, our feeling of respect with others. We don't want to walk into a job with, with whether we like it or not, don't, don't like the job if we feel disrespected. And uh, if we start disrespecting others as well, um, <laughs> well you know, yeah. that's the cruel irony. I mean, you know, you treat others as you are treated um, and it becomes a hostile the word is toxic environment. And I think so often um, in my work and I'm experimenting with the idea of a, of a or a workplace as community. And that is anchored so much in love and respect. You can't have community without respect. You can't have it without love. So, so Lou, tell me what love means in an organizational view. How does it work in an organization? So. Well, it's, it's it's not the typical love we think of. So, you know, there's uh, um, uh, two authors, Meyer and Allen, who came up with a study uh, in in '91 about uh, about organizational commitment and, and love, really. Uh, and Barsade and Allen, similar kind of thing, where they said basically uh, co companion love, friendship love um, that we have for each other um, creates more engagement, creates more commitment, um, organizational commitment. Um, what I said was, okay, companion love is great um, and friendship is great. However, it has to be systemic. So what does that mean, systemic? And so systemic means inside of the company and outside the company. So what, what's interesting about this is we're, we're not just saying it's the company itself. We're saying it's the whole ecosystem, customers too, not just loving customers, customers loving the company. So when you go into, say, a UPS store, a customer, a customer may be irate, could be short with the with people uh, who and demand things, and that happens a lot of the time, especially in higher income areas. 
And people may not know how to deal with that kind of response or, or in hospitality environments. So they could easily lash out when they're inside with peer groups. Mm -hmm. So love in this concept is about a larger community based learning. And that is basically customers should be just as responsible for love and respect as employees should be responsible for love and respect, especially today. And this is happening with uh, new employees, young professionals who are entering the workforce and simply don't want to be treated poorly. No, that's so important. And, and the sad irony is, is that's what we're asking for, Lou. But our public discourse is is becoming savage. I mean, the reason I wrote Grace three years ago was because I it was my little attempt to try to, to introduce some uh, sanity of be the better natures of ourselves, better nature of ourselves. Uh, and but it's but oh, I, I you hit the key point. We don't. I don't think we want to be angry with them. I mean. Our social media fosters it, and people are getting rich off that. They may want to do the anger, but society as a whole does not. Uh, um. I, that's right. And, and when we give common best practices, common best practices for how to love and respect inside companies, Starbucks did it wonderfully, and others uh, like McDonald's, that you think back to that example, Ritz Carlton, those kinds of examples, um, where it's written in to the daily uh, uh, kind of process automation to what you do. It makes it easy. People want to know what to do. They want to know how to be great. And when you you uh, make when you put it in a by a, in a stepped approach, it's easier for people to do, and they can learn it inside of their their uh, kind of neural pathways. Now, what's interesting is that it doesn't always happen. You know, one of my one of my friends uh, uh, in in a most love workplace. Uh, he he's the CEO of Automation Anywhere. His name is Mahir Shukla. He talks a lot about ro robotic process automation and saying that if we can't automate the things that are simple to us, uh, we won't one day be able to uh, to uh, ski the rings of Saturn or or take in the energy of black holes uh, to to catapult to new universes and just. I can think of, yeah, I think of nothing better to compare that to, which is um, how do we best respect and achieve together? Well, it's by making it easy to know what to do to automate that kind of uh, 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 behavior so it can be easier for everybody to do. Now, that, uh, Lou, that is absolutely fascinating because uh, if you said automation, I don't, uh, the first two words that come to mind with automation are not love and respect. So how does this, by automating or routinizing, how does that enable us to act on our better natures? So well, I, believe, I believe the first step is technology. I, mm -hmm. I, I do. And you'll see a new uh, Harvard Business Review article on uh, t uh, digital transformation and how that helps uh, companies to create the perfect job, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the, the truth is that it, if you think of it from the perspective of, let's say, a hospital or a clinic, you walk in, you're checked in, and they hold a, an iPad, and the iPad tells you uh, what to say to that patient. And the fact that they were checked in, therefore, they must say a certain thing to them, and they need that human interaction. And it's constantly in front of them. Uh, similarly, uh, with augmented reality glasses. Um, they're becoming better. Um, they're almost there. The chip is becoming small enough to go into our, our eyeglasses. It could tell us what to say and when to say it. And <laughs> if that, Boy, could I, right could, about now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, my wife would say, I need that. You know? <laughs> who, who doesn't? You know? yeah. I mean, but I think, I think what you're doing is if things are automated or routinized, then that frees the person to act um, more holistically, if you will, because he knows what the next, he or she knows what the next steps are. Correct. So, Absolutely. And you can still yeah. act like a human being because you're still yourself and you're still at your best and you've checked the boxes. So as not to hurt that individual, because people expect specific things in their customer or even employee journey during the day. And they expect to get things done quickly, to have strategic speed, to be precise in their job them itself. We need those things. We can't let things fall through the cracks. Too much can happen that would really harm a company.
Okay. Now, um, t- toward love and respect, that isn't going to happen unless there's the magic word, and that's leadership. So you argue and show and prove and demonstrate and research and even speak about it when you're not heckled um, uh, that there are leaders at every level. So how does this? How do leaders at every level deliver on this premise, Lou? So. I love the question because I think about droplets of water and how they create larger clouds and, you know, how little dots can seem so different when you look at it from a different perspective. So leaders, employees at all different levels can really make a difference to create that kind of larger picture, that big cloud. Right. And companies, uh, specifically people who are going up the ranks or perhaps who are um, beginning to take on new roles, they have to look up and look down, right? And see who and what they're stepping on. Uh, and it's so important because there's those, you know, Charlie Brown had, has a new special coming out. Uh, and it's uh, it's a small thing is Charlie Brown. And uh, Charlie Brown is <laughs> coming out it's on Apple TV. And um, I'm really excited to see it because um, uh, Sally has a dandelion on the, on the pitcher's mount. And um, and Charlie Brown has this big, huge, you know, uh, baseball game, and Sally just loves this dandelion. So, <laughs> and she loves it. She looks at it and like, you know, say, "Don't laugh. This is the dandelion, right? You have to look at the dandelion, look closer, right. because that's where it's what it's all about." Not to say we're all wilting flowers. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm what I what, what I know to be true though is that we have to really you know, look up as we're going up and then look down and see, you know, who and what we're stepping on because it can be, it can be, be really well, I, I love that example. And I, I think it leads to something. And if I have my nomenclature right, you use a term called co-model, co-modeling fulfillment. So is explain that to us, Lou. So. Yeah, I love So, so, you know, that's what it's about. It's a, we're a team. And um, the, this the truth is that this this is not our ballpark. This is not our grounds. Um, and typically it's not. And it, with that being said, we still have to act as if we are in service to those grounds and we care about those grounds and we want to take care of them um, and, and not harm them. And uh, in order to do that, the co-creation model, I like what you said, the, so you, the co-creation model is one that people come together and create their future. Um, and they say, well, let's look at really what's going right and what we could do better and then cr- create what that new reality will be. That's how transformation happens. So when an executive comes into a company, if you're to come to me today, say, hey, Lou, I'm, I'm taking the job as um, uh, the new CEO of Ford or Lou, I'm taking and you say, Lou, I want your advice. I mean, you literally if you and I do believe you could be a great I. I know you could be a great CEO and you really, I, I think that could be true. You could come to me and say that Lou, what's your advice of my first 90 days? I'd say, well, you got to go on your listening tour and you have to create, you have to create your co-creation team because those are the people and your stakeholder team. And you have to start listening to what has been going right and what can go better and develop the next one to five to 10 years with people, give them roles, show your vision Um, enable that so that people begin collaborating, um, align your true values, yours is grace with others, um, develop that kind of respect so that people see you doing it immediately in little ways, small ways and big ways, and then begin achieving and showing that very um, uh, uh, vision taking hold um, and and the triumphs and struggles and uh, everything else in between. I like the, this idea, thank you, of the co-creation, co-modeling, and you use the uh, term, the magic word, and so often is listening, because I know all the, or, the research that you're doing, and we're amongst this great trend called the great uh, resignation. I prefer to call it the great liberation, because uh, when it's the war for talent, I think employees have won. <laughs> so, uh, and then I know you have exec- conversations with um, executives. Lou, how do I keep my people? W- what do you tell them? So, yeah. The first thing is what we're finding about the great resignation is that people are jumping, and guess where they're going? To other jobs they don't like. So they go. <laughs> so, so, 
<laughs> well, maybe, maybe I have to take that back. Maybe they didn't. Employees didn't win it. So. Right, right. Well, you, you never win when you, you hurt others, right? It's yeah. just, it's Dale Carnegie said. You know, he yeah. says you can't win an argument. You, uh, you, 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 when you when you lose, you you lose. When you when you lose, um, and and uh, so when when I, I believe people what we've seen is people are leaving and it has to be the light needs to be shined back on the employee and saying, all right, you're considering leaving and, and stop at that time, really stop them in their tracks and saying, what's happening with you? Are you, is your, are you planted on the mound? Do you need to be somewhere else? What's your, where are you? What are your strengths? Where can you feel love, give respect best? Um, you know, is it here? Perhaps you're not in, Perhaps you don't want to develop or change as a leader. And maybe that's why you're not getting the respect you want and deserve, because you may be misplaced. Um, you may not be. Um, you may not choose to change or be in the role that you actually have ascribed or, or has to be in. Um, and people often sometimes they don't know. They want to get to an SVP role, but they don't realize all of the real responsibilities that go along with it and find out that, hey, I should have just continued being an individual contributor. Um, so, so it's it's really about uh, working one on one with employees to discover who they truly are, what they truly want, and help them shine that light back on them. That's great, and that starts with listening. So, having a conversation. I, I'm glad you touched on this topic of uh, you know I want to be I think I want to be an SVP, but in reality, I love what I do, and I think we all see I see this a lot um, in in science or design or pharma where, you know, they're a great bench scientist and that's why they did 20 years of education. No one ever taught them to be a manager and in a managerial role, that's not fulfillment. Do you ever see that Lou? So, yeah, a lot. It's, it's the, the old uh, technical um, people who are technical in acumen and awesome at what they do. Perhaps it's a product designer or it's a QA engineer, uh, any, any of those above, or it's a, it's a programmer. Um, and they become all of a sudden, you know, the chief technical officer, the chief information, whatever it may be, or uh, it could be uh, the head of finance of one division becoming a chief financial officer of a huge company. Um, it, they need a lot of help in developing um, right. to get to that point. And tr truth is, things may happen at that point. They they act if they act the same way they used to in that new role. A lot goes down, and a lot is harmed on board level, on organization level. Um, they need to get really. They have to really get their stuff together immediately because the show is on. Right. That show is on. Well, as someone we know once said, um, what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> Tip of the cap to Marshall Goldsmith. <laughs> so, absolutely. You know, we, have a, we have a comment from your colleague, Scott, who says companies that focus on how the work is done are those that uh, rather than what is done, than just what's done, are those who are winning the war, winning top talent. Do you agree with your colleague or do you want to throw Scott under the bus? So <laughs> I love what he said. I love what yeah. he said um, because, um, you know, we have, we start, used to start with just why, it, you know, and it was all about the why, you know, we mm -hmm. do this because we're, whatever, this whole, this compelling why. Um, the truth is now we need to know how. And we need to know how in very simple, depth approaches. And um, that is, that is, that is. How, how but, but when we say that, I mean, a little bit of a pushback on that. Um, we want to let employees discover that how, too, don't we, Lou? So we do, we do. The discovery of the how is, is what you talked about with the co creation, co modeling. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's how we, together with Grace, right, go and create. And so, so I do believe that I do believe that the how is created together, yes. And it's also created with um, a great, great leaders, I would say, who are open, honest and transparent and wish to create, go create with other people. And um, you know, that that really is hard to come by. You have to really find and develop that. You know, and um, given the framework of the great resignation, Scott raises another interesting point about it's 
it's one size doesn't fit all. There are different paths to careers and career development. And so having that conversation or at least avenues where people can explore, I think is important. And do you see that in the research that you do with the best loved companies? So Yeah. Yeah. I give it, the things we've been finding out a lot about with most loved workplaces um, are that they are given those career opportunities. They are given the opportunity to have cross-functional rotations, to try out new jobs, to see what fits them best. Um, more and more choice is being given to people for so many things, uh, whether it be affinity groups uh, uh, with, to help them uh, with different um, needs they may have. Um, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be uh, neurodiversity, some companies are working now uh, to help with uh, transgender uh, uh, surgery. Uh, other companies are giving uh, leave um, for uh, different kinds of um, of ceremony. Um, there, there's huge amounts of um, uh, groups that are forming around um, diff different uh, LGBTQ um, uh, specific um, areas. Uh, and so uh, there's a real opening of uh, people's minds to the sort of uh, the beautiful things that make up our, our diversity and each other. Yeah, I love that. And it really comes down to inclusion and true inclusion in the sense that we're looking at the whole person. And I like to think of the most successful companies are those who value, who look at their employees as contributors. And what you just said about respecting difference or embracing difference, now, you know, um, if you're transgender, LBGTQ or something different. And then it doesn't have to be a, 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 about that, but it's about elder care, child care, what all the different pressure. We are human beings. We bring ourselves to work. And I think the more we can express ourselves, or at least in a degree, makes us more uh, willing to contribute. Do you see that, Lou? So. I t totally see that, John. Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the need is really throughout the entire spectrum because it, it, it helps. It's a springboard for us to create our, our uh, beliefs around how we treat each other. And that may be, I, I mean, just recently, there's been a sort of an up, upsurge in understanding and care for ageism at, at past 50 plus 60 plus in that there's been you know if if you're past 50 you're thought of as obsolete in the uh in the uh business world and you know th this is a form of of uh discrimination in a very serious way um and so it's you know while we we re we should respect diversity throughout the entire range of working. Uh, we're all still on this earth um, and we're all here to continue to contribute um, in our own ways. And if we choose to develop, choose to work, choose to be a part of that uh, system and um, then we should be allowed to, to do so. Uh, let me give you a novel thought then, Lou. I think that comes down to when we view people as the whole person, that comes down to love and respect. <laughs> so, so it really does. It does. Lou, you, Lou, you and I could go on for another three hours, um, but um, I know you are a busy person and you know I ask every guest a question about uh, an example of grace. Do you have a story or an example you want to share with us, Lou? So. Grace is such a, an, an enormous and wonderful um, uh, uh, concept. And, um, you know, I, I think of, of, of grace in the small things that happen every day. You know, um, it's the opportunity that I may have missed, uh, you know, uh, with um, where I could have taught a child something that I, I didn't, right, um, at the moment. And going back and helping that child to understand better, you know, what, what, she could have done better, right? And that happens to me daily. Um, <laughs> now, says the father of three or two yeah. or whatever. You know, so, yeah. so yeah, so that it doesn't, I really think grace is about giving of yourself every day. And I feel like I do that when I can teach. When, and, and I have a, a thought that might come up or it comes from somewhere, I don't know what it is, to kind of nudges me, go help that person. And it, help, it happens to me daily. So I, it may be a text that I send to somebody and say, have you thought of this for what you're doing in 10 minutes? Does that help kind of thing? Or what can I do to help you today, right? And so these, the, I, I, when you asked me to give that story, I thought to myself, grace is continuous. And I thought it would be best to 
I'd love everybody to today, even put in the chat comments, tell us who you are, number one. But number two, what is that grace moment for you that you can do today? Because in my mind, it's pick up that text literally now and say, some, give some advice to someone in a loving way. You care about them. You know they're going to go through something. Tell them what you would want to hear. Give them the platinum rule. Treat others how you like to treat yourself. <laughs> right? We'll do it platinum. Give them, give them that. So I, I think I, there's a, here's an example. Someone's going through surgery. It's happened before. Tell them how, what you'd want to hear before going to surgery. They're going to about to go under. Okay. So they, you, maybe you could tell them about uh, a time when you, you really cherish being with them. Right. Or give them advice to think about that time. Right. Before you go, go under. And I mean, there's so many small ways you can do that. Use your text right now to do that and give that to <laughs> others. That's what I really hope to happen when you ask me the question. Oh, what a lovely thought. No one has, until you, Lou, has ever connected grace to texting, but I know what you're <laughs> talking about. And that's so real. And I'm glad you shone a light, shined a light shined a light or shone a light <laughs> on, excuse me, on grace are, are micro uh, steps. It's It can be both transactional and transformative and sharing of yourself uh, with another um, and connecting with them. And that's what grace does. So, And that's what you do for us, Lou. So anyway, sadly, we have to wrap this up. Lou, how can people find you? So lewiscarter.com. Uh, they can go to mostloveworkplace.com. Um, sign up because we will need your data by May 31st. You'll need to give it, show that you are a most love workplace. And we're, it's totally free. That's the thing about us is that I told, I just said to you before is that we value companies. And we've, if, if you're a company that wants to be most love, if you value loving your employees at the center of your business strategy, then this is what you should take part in. We give it for free. We don't exclude anyone. So if you're not in this, you're excluding yourself. So go to most loved workplace, most love workplace.com and you'll see the registration button or you click on the process to see what the hundreds of other companies have done. And they're so stoked about it. You should see the, the videos of people yelling and screaming and get excited and about it. So that's where you could find me more, li more likely though, take part in this transformation, this revolution of companies who are placing love at the center of their business strategy. Lou, what you're doing in the research you're doing and collecting great stories and great examples of company, my friend, that is an example of grace because you're trying to make it a better workplace and a better society and a better world. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much, John, for having me on.